A.C. Grayling is professor of philosophy and supernumerary fellow of St. Anne's uh, College, Oxford. He has written and edited many books on philosophy and other subjects. He writes for various papers and is a frequent broadcaster on BBC Radio. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, and in 2003 was a Booker Prize judge. He is also honorary associate, associate of the National Secular Society. A.C. Grayling, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's very kind. I should add, by the way, that uh, if I look a little tired, it's because I'm chairing the Man Booker Literary Prize this year. As you know, the prize is announced on Tuesday. We had 156 novels to read this year, <laughs> so it, uh, it did cut into sleeping time a little. Well, my, my theme this afternoon is um, uh, education and uh, religion. And uh, religion impacts on education in at least four ways. One, of course, is uh, the problem of uh, faith-based schooling, as it's called, where uh, a, an education or a so-called education is predicated on the school in question having a, a commitment, a religious commitment, a faith outlook. The second is in the observance of um, religious practices in a school. You may know that uh, in England, I'm talking about England rather than the United Kingdom in general, because the United Kingdom is a complex entity, um, there is a, a legal requirement for an act of worship in schools. It's not much observed by many schools, that's true, but there is a law requiring that this should be the case. And uh, the problem with um, religious observance in schools is that it gives uh, children from a very early age onwards the impression that religion is something to be taken seriously because grown-ups are doing it uh, and uh, it's, it sets the wrong kind of example. <coughs> Makes it seem as if it's serious and legitimate and, a, and an important part of the, the fabric of, of school life. Now I won't say very much about that um, because uh, in uh, at least many parts of the, um, uh, of the Western world, uh, in constitutionally secular countries like the United States of America, um, it's a very odd fact, isn't it, that constitutionally secular countries seem to be highly observant religiously, <laughs> US and Turkey being examples, but in those um, countries, at any rate, acts of worship in schools are meant not to happen. They do, but they're meant not to happen. So I won't say very much more about that. The third way that uh, religion impacts on education is in what is called, in schools in this country, for example, religious education. That is, education about religion, religious outlooks and beliefs. And of course, you will hear from people who teach uh, RE, as it's called. It used, by the way, when I was a child, it used to be called RI, which meant religious instruction, which is a quite different thing. Just being told what it is you're meant to believe and how to behave, but it has mutated into religious education. And there is a, a major problem with this, because you will hear from people who teach RE in schools that they teach about all the religions, they do it in a neutral way, they may even sometimes rather tentatively mention in passing atheism, humanism and secularism, but um, the claim generally is that this is meant to be an introduction to a very important element in the history of uh, humankind, given that uh, religion has been so much of an influence on individual lives and societies throughout recorded history. But uh, I want to illustrate a major difficulty that attaches to religious education. And finally, the fourth way that religion impacts on education is that in religious societies, the religious outlook of those societies results in not just the interference with education itself in the educational process, but also in the exclusion of a section of society, almost always girls, or interference in their education. And I'm, you've heard some very eloquent uh, uh, comments about that in the panel that preceded this. I just want to mention one thing. If you look, for example, at the Middle East, you will see the literacy rates among women are very low. In the Middle East as a whole, uh, the latest figures that I've seen at any rate suggest that about 53% of women and girls in Middle Eastern countries uh, can read. Now, in some countries, like Qatar, for example, the rate is very much higher. In other countries, and in North Africa, the rate may be lower. The astonishing thing about these variable literacy rates is that in the Middle East, more women, there are more women than men in universities 
they tend to be more numerous despite having less opportunity for education at primary and secondary level. And yet, of course, their participation in the economy and in political life is extremely low. So those uh, girls who get a chance of an education may very well uh, be able to go to university, but the opportunities for them afterwards are very limited. Uh, and so the skills that they learn, the, the um, outlooks that they acquire there, don't get practical expression in the development of their societies. And that, of course, is a, a, a huge loss, a hemorrhage of talent and opportunity in those societies. But the worrying thing, of course, is the low overall literacy rate because it means that um, the, there is a loss, a deficit in the advantages of education for women. The United Nations has published figures showing that if women have even just elementary education, it means they have fewer children. Uh, ch uh, childhood mortality rates tend to drop and the children are better nourished. The women can get access to their rights and can manage their affairs. And if you imagine what it's like to be a member of a family with an illiterate mother, um, you can see the effect that it might have on all children, but especially, of course, on the girls who don't have a, a role model or who are not given the aspirations to press for education for themselves. So in religious societies, the effect on education is an extremely deleterious one. And it is an insidious one also. Look at Jordan, for example, where there is a very high participation of girls in education up to a certain point, up to a certain age, but then very large percentages of girls drop out early because they marry early. And uh, that, that is a loss to the community also. It's not the religion is not the only problem for girls' education, of course, because there are many places where girls simply can't go to uh, school in um, developing countries, in very poor countries in Africa, for example, um, school facilities militate against the participation by girls. If the schools don't have uh, lavatories with doors, then when girls reach puberty, they can't go to school. And this is another great barrier. That's an economic barrier rather than a religious one. So I think those points are, are very familiar. And as I say, they've been very eloquently made here before. So I'm going to concentrate, if I may, just on those two points uh, about uh, uh, um, religion and its influence on education faith-based schooling and so-called religious education in schools. And first on faith-based schooling. Well, it has to be pointed out, and it's something that uh, we need to remind ourselves of constantly, that the aims of education at its best and the requirements of religious observance and commitment are at odds with one another. Re education at its best is about making people think, making them good inquirers, good evaluators of information, makes them critical and questioning, makes them want to look for the evidence and the arguments that will support a given outlook. Now you can get at the press of a button and at the speed of light almost any information that you want from the internet, although of course the internet is not only a marvellous source of information but it's also uh, the biggest lavatory wall in history on which everybody can scribble their graffiti and there is of course a great deal of nonsense on the internet as well. Um, you, you will know, and if you don't know this, you will be alarmed to know that uh, Wikipedia, for example, many, many sites on Wikipedia are constantly being attacked and challenged by people who want to change the information or alleged information on them. I'm told that the um, Wikipedia page on Israel, for example, is changed almost every second of the day, of every day, because people are constantly attacking it and wanting to put in uh, their view or a defense of a view or some misinformation and the rest. So one has to be a very, very good and careful evaluator of this wonderful resource that the internet is. And I do love to tell people a little anecdote about how uh, easy it is to be uh, duped by the internet. You will have heard of the French philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy. Uh, he has flowing locks. Not necessary to have flowing locks to be a philosopher, by the way, but he has them. <laughs> He wears uh, rather magnificent shirts with large collars and a plunging décolletage. You may have seen him, or the handsome hairy chest. Uh, I did once ask him uh, why he dresses like that. I said, Bernard, why do you have your shirt open to your belly button? He said, he said because I'm hot. Anyway, <laughs> the thing that happened to Bernard was that he recently published a book, which when it landed on the bookshelves in the bookshops, I was discovered to contain a reference to an unknown French philosopher of the 18th century called Botul, B-O-T-U-L. You've heard this story. 
Uh, and then uh, uh, it was pointed out to Bernard that there is no such individual. It was made up by some joker on the internet that he's <laughs> quoted by, by Bernard. And Bernard would have noticed this if only he had uh, uh, cottoned on to the fact that uh, Monsieur Bottiot's theory is botulism, which of course is <laughs> hardly a philosophical outlook, although you have to be philosophical if you suffer from it. Well, uh, with uh, Gallic flair, of course, when, uh, when Bernard was told this, he said, oh, well, you know, uh, what he says was good, so I quote him. So, uh, <laughs> now, there is an example of how careful one must be with the Internet, and that means that it is a really compelling matter that uh, our education process should produce people who are critical, who are skeptical in a healthy way, who really do know how to evaluate, how to assess evidence and argument, how to be good at doing that. And that, of course, is exactly the opposite of what is required of you if you are a committed devotee of a given religious outlook. And this is not a particularly partisan or, or controversial view. After all, the very word Islam means submission. In Christianity, one of, the, one of the greatest sins is the sin of pride, that is, of thinking that you can work it out for yourself or stand on your own two feet. Christians pray, not my will be done, but thy will be done. It's a great uh, doctrine in Christianity to die to the self, to recognize oneself as a fallen, fallible, weak, helpless and hopeless individual who requires to be saved. We are born ill, we need that doctor, and uh, we're not going to be able to do it on our own. No amount of dieting, fasting and taking vitamin C tablets is going to help. So the, the, the very premise of a religious commitment is that you can't do it. You can't be critical. You shouldn't question. Indeed, you must have faith. And faith is in the very face of evidence and contrary reason uh, to accept the doctrines or teachings of a religion. And perhaps the most compelling contrast between uh, the aims and values of education on the one hand and on the other hand what is required of people who take a sincere and serious uh, uh, um, view of their religious commitments is that you can explain to anybody the chief doctrines and promises, the, the, the story of any of the world's major religions in less than half an hour. But it takes a bit longer to understand physics and chemistry. And this is part of the reason why, when the people use the phrase faith-based schooling, faith schools, it seems to be a direct paradox, a direct oxymoron. And I always say to people, the argument against faith schooling uh, can be summed up in just two words. In fact, you could choose any phrase you like, but the two words that mean something for people who live in these islands anyway are these, Northern Ireland. Because in Northern Ireland, Catholics and Protestants were educated separately. Education was ghettoized by religion. The result was a continuing division in that society, continuing separation, uh, and the continuance, therefore, of conflicts between the communities who were educated apart from one another in that way. And that is perhaps one of the worst things about faith-based schooling, is that it makes people uh, more committed, more signed up to, the identity, the overriding single identity of a religious commitment. And we know, I know you were all reading Amartya Sen in the bath last night on the very question of identity. You know very well what he says there. We are all of us possessors of multiple identities. We're all of us, as it might be, spouses and teachers and neighbors and visitors and voters and travelers and tennis players. And there are many, many different things that we are. And to adopt a single overriding identity to put on uh, an item of clothing or to wear a symbol which announces to other people that they must treat you according to your self-chosen identity in that respect is not just uh, a failure to recognize the multiplicity and diversity within a single human being, but it is also an insult to others to say, uh, I've chosen uh, to act and believe this way, you've got to treat me accordingly. Whereas what of course we should be doing is treating everybody that we meet as a human being first and foremost and to offer them the respect of being one until they lose that respect. And education should, of course, be about increasing the generosity and sympathy of our outlook, of uh, uh, our attitude towards the world and towards other people, and providing us with those critical skills that I mentioned. So the very, very concept of faith-based education is inimical to the great aim that education seeks to subserve. The second thing I want to talk about is religious education, education about religion in schools. 
Now, I repeat the point I made earlier, and that is that, of course, the religious traditions, religious outlooks, attitudes, and, and uh, ideas have been uh, of immense significance in human history and remain so now. It would therefore be a failure on the part of an education system not to address them, not to teach people about them and to discuss them and to explore their origins and sources. But here is the difficulty. Religious education is about the religious traditions. And religious traditions are one strand, one and only one strand, and in fact of rather primitive origin in the great history of ideas, in the great effort that human beings have made to make sense of their world and of one another. Religion is only part of that story. And if you knew all of the story, suddenly religion takes on a very different aspect. If you only teach about the religions, if you ignore the philosophies, if you ignore the rise of science, if you ignore the other traditions of thought, of political thinking, of thinking about society and the individual, of the discoveries made in sociology and psychology, if you ignore most of the great repertoire of inquiry into our world and ourselves, and pick out just this one strand of what fundamentally began as the metaphysics of illiterate shepherds 3,000 years ago, then you are, of course, going to get a very, very distorted idea about what we have thought in the way of ethics and politics and what the sources of our better understanding of the world is now. And there are some very, very simple ways that you can, that you can explain this. Let me give you just two examples. When, um, first I should mention, by the way, that in this connection, uh, that there is also a rather lazy assimilation of some of the major um, traditions of thought in our world to the concept of religion, which, as you know, is a very amorphous concept. Any of those of you who have engaged in discussions about religious beliefs and uh, uh, concepts will know that your, uh, your uh, discussant, if he or she is a person of religion, will always resort to the phrase, well, that's not what I believe, or that's not what I mean by God or religion or something. And this is because the word religion denotes an enormous blob of jelly, so that every time you try and land a punch on it, it just simply <laughs> absorbs it and get, re resumes its shape again afterwards. So um, you're dealing with such ill-defined concepts that it's terribly difficult to argue uh, against them. Well, the um, great uh, philosophical traditions of Buddhism Theravada, uh, small vehicle Buddhism, the original Buddhism, and of Confucianism, are now sometimes regarded as religions. This despite the fact that uh, Siddhartha Gautama begged his disciples not to make him a god and not to turn Buddhism into a religion, but uh, we've all seen the life of Brian, we all know the shoe, the shoe, and uh, so it's very natural, of course, for people to turn great teachers into, uh, into gods. In fact, for a while, Plato was regarded as having been the son of a god. That was just a formula used uh, in antiquity for people who were, in one or another way, uh, outstanding. Uh, poets and soldiers and the others, they were thought to be so out of the norm that they couldn't possibly have been fathered by a human being. Uh, it, must, it must have been a deity who was the father. And so the idea of Jesus being the son of God is, of course, just a, a rather hackneyed trope of, that had existed right the way through, through antiquity. But that's not something which is taught in religious education. So here's an example. It's a little known fact um, um, even among Christians themselves, and you can, you can test this out uh, uh, on yourselves uh, if you've had a Christian background or on Christian friends, that the canon of uh, literature that defines the Christian outlook uh, was, it was only decided upon some four centuries after the events that they purport to report. That the, the early Christians were um, Jews, and their beliefs and attitudes were those of the Jewish people. So one thing that um, they believed was that when you die, your body is buried in the ground and it waits there until the Messiah returns and at the last trump the graves open and we rise from them. St. Paul, and St. Paul's letters of course are the very earliest uh, documents of Christianity, says that when we rise from the grave we will do so with a new body. This is the bit of St. Paul I like because I want a six pack and a tan. So when the, uh, <laughs> when the last trump sounds, that, that's what I'm looking forward to. But um, when, uh, um, you may remember again, if you were reading about the early history, the fourth century history of Christianity, that the Emperor Constantine uh, issued an edict, the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, or as we now say CE for the Common Era, saying that Christianity could be one of the religions of the empire. Uh, in less than a century, 
Um, it was the only religion in the empire because once the Christians got busy, they either incorporated all the other religions by telling people, oh, well, Diana's name is really Mary, or they, they simply suppressed it. And they started to build churches. And when they did, they um, had to exhume the bodies of the saints to take them into the church to be relics. Now, St. Paul had made the mistake, and it's a great mistake, this one. You know what they say about Bernie Madoff, the man who got into big trouble with his, uh, his um, scheme? was that he, he, the mistake he had made was to promise returns in this life to his uh, um, clients, <laughs> which is, of course, a mistake that the churches don't make. But St. Paul made that mistake because he said that the saints, that is, those who had suffered martyrdom or who were uh, particularly zealous in the cause, that their bodies would not see corruption, that is, they would not rot in the grave. And when they were exhumed, to the great distress of the exhumers, they were found precisely to have followed the ordinary biological principles of our planet. And so when they were moved into churches, uh, a new story had to be um, given about what had happened. And so four centuries into the Christian story, a, a doctrine was imported into Christianity wholesale from Platonism, Neoplatonism, uh, under the influence of Plotinus, the philosopher, the doctrine of the immortal soul a doctrine that uh, Plato had been writing about 500 years before the time of Christ, which hadn't been accepted by uh, majority opinion in the Jewish world, but which was taken over by the Christians four centuries in, in order to deal with this embarrassment. That was one thing. The other thing that uh, you don't hear when um, religious education is happening in schools is the following. That if you were to take just the canonical gospels, just the four gospels and the writings of St. Paul, and you ask yourself this question, what do these writings tell me about how to live? What should I do? What those writings will tell you is, of course, you must be kind and generous to widows and orphans and treat your fellows in uh, society as, uh, um, as yourself, uh, love your neighbor. Those tenets are instructions in all ethical systems. There is no moral system in the world that doesn't enjoin that upon you. But what Christianity particularly asks you to do is the following. Give away all your money and everything you own. Take no thought for tomorrow. Consider the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor weave. If your family disagree with you, and by the way, they will if you give away all your money, turn your back on them. <laughs> Don't marry. Don't marry unless you're about to burn, said St. Paul. Uh, a little footnote here, by the way. Of course, Christianity's founder is St. Paul. I mean, he's the person who, in effect, made it all up. And, uh, it, it is the only religion in the world, the only one major religion in the world, whose founder did not say that he could have a multiplicity of wives. If you think of all the other founders of major religions, they all allowed themselves to have a rather large number of wives. Muhammad, peace be upon him, had 13. <laughs> Joseph Smith of the Mormons had 33. The, 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 the Jewish peoples were not very um, particular about this. I mean, Solomon had 1,000, so that was uh, pretty good going. But Christianity, no. Why? Mainly, I think, because Paul was gay. My mouth really did. <laughs> he did travel around the uh, Mediterranean world with a couple of handsome young men, as you may remember. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so St. Paul said, uh, you know, you don't, uh, don't, don't uh, marry unless you're about to burn. Now this teaching, give away everything, take no, make no plans, don't marry, don't have a family, turn your back on your family. This is the teaching for a people who were very, very sincerely of the view that they lived at the end of time, at the end of history. The Messiah was just about to come back. You've got to be like the wise virgins, keep the wicks of your lamps trimmed. Tomorrow, next week, next month, the end of time will happen and the kingdom of God will come. Of course you don't need money. Of course you don't make plans. Now, after four centuries, and people have been looking at their sundials, and it was <laughs> taking a bit longer than, uh, than, than they had been rather hoping, they needed an ethical outlook that was a bit richer than that. Where did they get it from? The great traditions of Greek ethical thinking and philosophy, mainly from Stoicism. So Christianity, several centuries into its story, had to import a lot of ideas to make it work and keep it going. I mean, after all, you know, literally thousands of people had really tried to obey the, obey the injunction to give away everything and to live simply. All the Eremites and Her Hermits of the Desert Fathers had all gone out, denied themselves. Some people even took a pair of scissors to their private parts because they didn't want to, you may remember, um, all the sad story. 
the main individual in question regretted it afterwards and who wouldn't. So there was a rather uh, uh, dramatic and heroic attempt to live by those precepts in those first centuries. But what we think of now, and when, a, when a, we see in Poland that the uh, schools are told to teach Christian, quote unquote, Christian values, what they are teaching is a slightly codified version of Greek philosophy and metaphysics. And it's not, therefore, um, uh, an unimportant matter that people who were taught about these things should be told that. It should be put into context because the minute that you put the religious traditions into context, you suddenly see them in a very different light. You see them as part and a rather undeveloped, a rather primitive part of the effort that we human beings have made to make better sense of our world. I'll give you one more example and I think this is, this is quite a shocking one. Why is it that uh, uh, homosexuals have been so persecuted throughout history in the societies of the book, um, in Judaism and Christianity and Islam? Why is it that even as we speak now, uh, gays are being arrested and, uh, and condemned to death in Iran, for example, hanged from cranes in the town square? How can this be happening? Well, part of the answer, a large part of the answer is this. The very early Jewish people were a herding people. Their flocks of sheep and goats were an existential matter for them. It really mattered that those flocks should increase, that any reproductive activity between sheep and goat should result in pregnancy. Milk, clothing, meat, it was an existential matter that the flocks should increase. Therefore, any kind of activity which was non-reproductive was frowned upon. When you go back and read the Old Testament, it doesn't matter how many wives and slave girls and concubines the patriarchs had, just so long as whatever they did with them could result in pregnancy. Anything that, any sexual activity that didn't and couldn't result in pregnancy was very much frowned on. Book of Genesis in the story of Judah and Tamar tells us what happened to Onan when he spilled his seed on the ground because he didn't want to bring up children to his brother's name. He was struck dead by God on the spot. This was because he hadn't let his seed go to, it, to the place that it should, the seed to the egg. And when a man lies with a man as with a woman, of course there's going to be no pregnancy there, and so that's an abomination. And we are instructed, if you're very serious about your scriptures, to go and stone them. I know a few here, some friends of mine, we can take them out and stone them afterwards if you're feeling serious suddenly <laughs> about this matter. And this horror, this horrid attitude... Uh, has uh, persisted to, to our day because of that fact, because of that early fact. And one of the consequences of it was that in the churches, the Christian church's moral theology for a very long time, masturbation was regarded as worse than rape because rape can result in pregnancy. Now, if that isn't twisted moral thinking, I don't know what is. And it's one consequence of the failure to draw out all the different aspects of the origins of how we think, of putting religions into context of a broader story. So religious education in schools, the very word religious education, is a, an indication of the fact that we've stripped out one strand from that great story of our forebears' effort and our own effort to make sense of our world and to give it a salience, a significance and importance as if it outweighed I mean, think of it. You know what Bertrand Russell said? He said about uh, the Buddha and Jesus and Socrates. He said, Buddha was much more compassionate and Socrates much smarter than Jesus. Well, that happens to be true. And if you were to take that seriously, you would make jolly sure that Socrates and the teachings of the Buddha ought to be on the curriculum. The teachings of the Buddha, not as a religious teaching, but as a metaphysical view and an ethical uh, set of doctrines based on that metaphysical view. So my great argument about so-called religious education, education about religion, is that it is too partial and it distorts the importance of those ideas when there are many, many, many equally and more important ideas in the history of, of our species and its effort to make sense of the world. Of the world. I've been um, keen, in fact, to point out to people that uh, sometimes uh, the phrase philosophy and religion is bandied about as if those three words, philosophy and religion, somehow hung together. And of course they don't. Philosophy is a, is a word like science which denotes a whole range of activities predicated on the idea of inquiry, examination, skepticism, challenge, really trying to get people to dig down to the assumptions on which they rest their worldview, their outlook. Whereas 
uh, a commitment to a religion is a commitment to one way of thinking about the world uh, and uh, a way which is, of course, uh, premised on some very, very outdated kinds of thinking. Even worse is the phrase philosophy and theology, which, uh, if you think about it rather carefully, is a bit like agriculture and growing tomatoes, because, of course, theology is about one small, rather dubious thing, the, the, the search for the cat that isn't there in the basement which doesn't have its lights on and so on. Whereas philosophy, of course, is a great range of endeavors in ethics and political science, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, reason, philosophical examination of the natural and social sciences. An enormous enterprise, uh, rich and fertile in efforts to make sense of things, whereas, of course, theology uh, assumes that there is something to talk about where, of course, there may not be. Now, I point out to people that um, one very, very important part of education is the examination of assumptions and beliefs, of being extremely critical about them, of looking for the evidence, and of recognizing the very great importance of a very simple example offered us by Carl Sagan. Remember Carl Sagan? who a wonderful man, despite the fact that he pronounced it Cosmos, you may remember, in his <laughs> series about the cosmos. <coughs> And the example he gave was this, and I end on this little anecdote, about the dragon in the garage. Remember this? Somebody says to you, I've got a dragon in my garage. You say, ooh, I've always longed to see a dragon. Oh, well, this one is invisible. Oh, well, could we hear it flapping its wings? Nope, this one is silent. Mm. Well, could we put talcum powder on the floor and see its footprints? Nope, this one never lands on the floor. Well, can we at least feel its hot breath? Ah, this one has cool breath. So by the time you've exhausted all the efforts that you could possibly make to test the claim that there's a dragon in the garage, what you've met with is the definition of the same thing as nothing. Now, it's that effort to test claims, to inquire, to examine, to look for the evidence, to get the arguments that education is all about. And religion is inimical to it. Learning about religions and religions in history, that is important, but it must be part of a much, much larger, much richer enterprise, which is the study of the history of ideas in general. And once that happens, suddenly, rather like it when you switch your television off and you get a tiny little point in the middle of the screen, that's how important religion will come to seem in that great adventure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you. Well, I, I just need to ask you whether we have time for some questions, comments, or complaints from anybody who would like to. Yes, there's one there. Yes. Yes. Is there a microphone? Or there we go, there's the there you go. Yes, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to comment on the existence of theology degrees independent of philosophy degrees, even in the top universities? Well, they do say of my own old university, Oxford, uh, that it is the home of lost causes, and I suppose it's just keeping up that tradition with the <laughs> theology. No, I'm afraid, I'm sometimes asked, uh, um, it wasn't mentioned, but uh, um, I'm the master of the New College of the Humanities in London, and um, people ask me, uh, but particularly because people who lecture there, uh, people like my friend Richard Dawkins and Stephen Pinker and Dan Dennis and others, uh, they notice that there are a bunch of atheists at the college, and so they say, is this an atheist college? And I say, no. And education is about teaching people how to think, not what to think, and we're not in that business, thank you very much. Uh, but I'm then asked, am I going to have a department of theology? I say, absolutely, after we've uh, instituted a department of astrology. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your presentation. I just wanted to make a small intervention on one point that you made at the beginning. Um, and it's when it comes to women's rights and secularism and the religious right. And obviously, the religious right poses a huge threat to women's rights. We know this. I work in an organization which has worked on this for 30 years. But when you use statistics like the ones that you quoted about the Middle East and women going 
to school and how that translates into the labour market. I just think it's very important to be careful about those statistics and those conclusions. Um, I think the ones you used came from the 2005 Arab Human Development Report, if I'm correct, which has been widely critiqued by um, two particular scholars since. Um, the argument being that women's um, achievement in education not translating into participation in the labour market is not necessarily due to cultural barriers, or not in every case, but is actually has a lot to do with the neoliberal economy and the opportunities for women within it. So I just wanted to say, when we talk about casting a sceptical eye on things, on the internet, on religion, on anything else, do it with the UN reports as well. Yes, thank you for that. It's an important point, that one, because there are various figures, aren't there? And the, the figures for participation in education of women in the Middle East between the ages of 15 and 24 are much more promising now than they were, that's true. And the figures that I quoted were ones that I managed to dig up for all women in Middle Eastern societies now. Participation in the workplace, um, the latest figures that I've seen are about 8% uh, in, uh, in the Gulf states. Um, and that, that, of course, is very worrying given that in some of the Gulf states, the uh, proportion of women in higher education is, is in excess of 60%. So, so it's very worrying. Now, you're quite right, I think, that it's not just religion, obviously, but uh, the way that our um, uh, global economy is uh, structured, that can be a great barrier to them too. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. Thank you. A question down there? But we can see you and you look magnificent, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Mick Penning from Stoke. Um, the, when uh, people, Muslim or Christian, find in conversation that I'm an atheist, and I'm sure everybody here has experienced this, Christians and Muslims alike, and other probably Jews as well, will say, well, it's the same with the Jehovah's Witnesses on the doorstep, or the Mormons. Where, where did it all come from? How, how, there must be a God. How do you answer that when they ask you this, when they put that to you? Oh, well, I mean, I simply point out that, that that's to try to explain uh, what, what, what is now less of a mystery uh, with an even bigger one, because all it does is just simply to remove the problem one step further back and, and complicates it further rather than solves it. So it's no kind of answer at all. Um, I, I say to, to people that they should try the following experiment. Instead of using the word God, use the name Fred. They say, <laughs> how did the universe came into existence? Well, Fred made it. And then you just suddenly see the vacuity of that remark. I mean, it doesn't completely unhelpful, doesn't mean anything or explain anything at all. I say to my, my uh, youngest daughter, whom I'm bringing up as an atheist, my wife thinks that she'll end up as a mother abbess as a result, because this is the way things <laughs> tend to go. But uh, I, I say to her, don't use the word God ever. Use the expression gods and goddesses. So when you're having a discussion with people, you ask them if they believe in gods and goddesses. Um, there is a, a, a person called William Lane Craig, you may have come across, who is a, a, a feisty. A, a dear. I got into trouble about him just recently because... Um, I had a, uh, apparently I had a debate with him on the radio some years ago and completely forgot about it. And then he challenged me to another debate and I said, no, no, thank you. Oh, I said, no, no, I said I would uh, debate him about the existence of fairies. Uh, because if he didn't believe in fairies, then I would just ask him to export all those arguments to the existence of gods and he would see the point. But um, apparently I had debated him, but it was so unmemorable that I'd forgotten. <laughs> so if you... If you Use a different expression. Just invite your interlocutor to say Fred instead of God. And then it, it, it illustrates in one swift move the emptiness of that kind of claim. There must have been Fred. How could there be a universe if there wasn't Fred? Let's try that one. Yes, there's a question here. Yes, far away. Sorry, hi. So um, your own efforts with the College of New Humanities was viewed in some areas with suspicion and, and caution. And what with the, the rise of, uh, of the conservative religious right and the prominent role they're playing in the current UK schooling system, do you ever envisage uh, a release from our current catch uh, where you know, the a secular, non-religious bias um, policy of education can ever be realised? Do you, do you see that happening? Well, um, I, I hope that th 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 that will come about. I mean, it's up to us in a way to work hard for it and to campaign for it. At the moment, the trends seem to be moving in the other direction, alas. 
but that's only a uh, um, motivation to work all the harder for it. It seems to me that, that, that we're at a, at a sort of cut, um, bottleneck moment in, in human history. People think that uh, religion and religious observance is on the increase, is resurgent, and it sounds like it, looks like it, but it may be, and this could just be wishful thinking on my part, but it may be that it's not a question of, of, of uh, proportions of people. Obviously, the world's getting bigger all the time, so absolute numbers are increasing, but it may not be the proportions of people are uh, becoming more religious, even in the face of uh, the difficulty of understanding the scientific worldview, which makes people resort to the quick and easy answer, the closed, neat little narrative of beginning, middle, and an end that a religion offers. But it just may be that because of globalization and because of the success of the secular outlook of science and uh, uh, of um, uh, arguments about the rule of law and so on, that the volume has been turned up. So it sounds as if there are more religious people around. It could be that when you force anybody into a corner, they're going to shout more loudly and act more violently than if they weren't in a corner. And that might be happening now because um, here's one consideration as the world globalizes. So in, for example, Muslim majority countries, you can imagine people of a traditional outlook feeling extremely anxious about it. You can imagine a Muslim father seeing an American movie with lots of pretty girls in bikinis running around and he's very anxious about the effect on his own daughters, let us say, and being angered by it and feeling threatened by it. And that might be uh, one reason why the, um, the temperature goes up. But it could be that we are seeing the very long drawn out and rather dangerous death throes, perhaps, of religion as a major force in society over the course of the next century. And what we are unhappily witness to is the, the, the thrashings of that, of that monster in our various societies. That could be wishful thinking, but I think if you look at the long-term trends, look, for example, the United States of America, Pew polling data, Pew Center polling data on um, nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S, the people who tick the nun box when it comes to religious uh, commitment, have been dramatically on the increase over the last three decades, especially among younger people, under 35s. And this is a, a powerful trend. I, I was in um, uh, the United States last year, um, I was touring a book called The God Argument. And by the way, I started this tour in Texas. And I said to my host there, I said, do you know, it would be tremendously good publicity uh, for the book if somebody shot me. I mean, missed, of course. That was <laughs> an important part of the deal. But it would have been great publicity for the book. And he rather dually said, uh, in Texas, assassination attempts are usually successful. So I thought, well. <laughs> But I was in Austin in Texas at the American Atheist Association meeting and the American Atheists are a very rowdy and uh, an energetic uh, bunch, they're a great bunch of people. And they've adopted what has been so successful for the gay rights movement in the US and elsewhere, which is to be out and proud about being an atheist, which is a difficult thing in America because you can suffer very considerable employment and social disadvantages for um, letting it be known that you're an atheist. But the, the out and proud uh, uh, sort of aspect of the movement now is uh, an extraordinary sign, I think, and may have a major impact there. I don't know. But of course, when one looks across the, the global landscape, it's a very mixed picture about the influence of religion. But um, my, my hope is that what we are seeing is one of the last great battles, really, between the two worldviews. There's a, a question. But actually, the, that gentleman, I think, was first. Sorry. Yes, this gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you for a broad and important survey of the whole issue. I'd just like to come to some specifics. Near my house, in fact, within two miles, we have a Muslim school, we have a Hindu school, we have a Sikh school, we have a Catholic school, all of them mainly populated by children from families that claim to belong to the, the religions. Another aspect, so it's worse than just teaching about religion, it's, it's teaching about sex. And the regulations about RE in this country lay down that you must give emphasis to Christianity and beyond that to the so-called principal religions. And that goes further. I, on the committee uh, that determines the so-called agreed syllabus, I'm only allowed to be there as a courted non-voting member. And teaching about non-religious approaches 
is an option, not a requirement. So it really is very built into the system. And also, but I do go around with people from different religions, but it comes as a surprise to them that there is a temple 12,000 years old in the southern part of Turkey. And I think a knowledge of the history as well as of the philosophy is something that children ought to carry. They ought to feel one with the human being who put their hand on the cave and left an imprint feeling that they at least counted. They should be proud. They should be proud of being human beings. And that is not what we're succeeding in teaching them. Right, okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop in a moment. Uh, my first remark is, sounds as if you should move. And the, the second thing is, <laughs> you're quite right. You're quite right. It is a very, very serious problem in faith-based schooling. Uh, in, uh, premised, by the way, on the warmest-hearted desire to be inclusive. Because, after all, there were Church of England schools, and then when Catholicism, you know, the Test and Corporation Acts were... Uh, repealed back in the 1820s and finally the Catholic Church wanted to have its schools funded by our taxpayers so we let uh, them and then Jewish people and Muslim people and Hindu people wanted the same treatment and entitlement and so uh, in the spirit of inclusiveness uh, we agreed to it and now what we have is this horror of, uh, of ghettoization of education so I'm completely with you. I think it is a scandal that non-religious outlooks are merely optional on the curriculum. They should be compulsory if there's to be religious education at all but I iterate my point. I think the campaign really ought to be for history of ideas, not for religious education, but for history of ideas of which religion would be one and one only strand. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Anthony Grayling. Entertaining, thought-provoking, enlightening. Thank you very much.